I get these inspired uh, sessions where I work with movies as modern day parables and then the spirit just comes ripping through and I did something recently down in Mexico, it was on this movie Dark City, which is really quite a spectacular movie and some amazing things came out of my mouth and then uh, they actually had good recording equipment and so they edited together a three hour movie uh, with me using this quite amazing movie and you know when you start to look different on the built environment even the the buildings and you realize it's not carpenters and bricklayers and uh, construction workers that have built these buildings it's actually the mind has projected this whole cosmos out but from the human level it seems like it's we call it the built environment I have to laugh because I was I was five years in the College of Design, Art, and Architecture and Planning <laughs> and then I discover many years later that everything's a projection of the mind. That particular movie really shows the mind and the unconscious mind literally generating, gyrating and generating buildings coming up kind of almost a psycho, psychokinesis using the power of the mind to project out buildings. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says that, that the miracle can save a thousand years. And I think for people that have been with, lived with me or worked with me, because I've been at this traveling and doing a number of things for like 20, 25 years with the Course, but it's been, uh, everything is so fast. Um, everything seems to swirl around me at, at an amazing speed. And it's, it's not a typical life. Uh, even I was saying with Sundari, it's like, I feel like with her life she's packed like maybe five or six, seven lifetimes into this life. And I, my friend Lisa Fair is the same thing. I can, you can just, when she goes and even tells her life, like you, you just wrote your book, but when she does, people just, their eyes roll because they can't even believe. It sounds like seven lifetimes. Uh, it doesn't sound like one life. And and I think that's also part of that celestial speed up, uh, that we, a quickening and an awakening, where it's not really a matter of time to wake up, it's a matter of willingness. It's a matter of readiness and willingness. And you're ready and you're willing, things just, you connect with Source, you connect with Spirit, and things just move super fast. And it, it can only go as fast as your mind is ready for it to go though. You know, some people say, I want it now, and they complain, I want it now. Well, if they wanted it now, truly, they'd have it now. <laughs> but there's some unconscious fear and resistance that's in there that is going on underneath the surface. So the character's going, I want it now, and pounding fist, and the subconscious mind is going, I don't want it now, and I don't want it at all. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Almost like a, a subconscious temper tantrum going on. And that's what we call it a split mind. Because there's a part of the mind that wants to wake up, and a part of the mind that wants to sleep. And we have some good clips from Dark City about the, mm -hmm. the attack thoughts. They're always promoting sleep, putting their hand over people's foreheads and going, sleep, sleep. And they're vicious, and they're murderous, and you know, that's what attack thoughts are. So hopefully tonight, um, I would say, oftentimes we I'll have an introduction and we'll kind of go around and, and everything, but I think Nikita has just felt so inspired with certain clips tonight that she can kind of intuitively get her fingers, instead of playing the piano, she's going to play movie maker with us tonight, <laughs> reach over and touch and, and show us various clips and then I think that will spur on questions and spur on our discussions. And what is this set for? Seven till when? Ten. Seven yeah. to ten. So we have a nice stretch really go on ten. Yeah. yeah, we can really let the movies, the movie yeah. clips be our springboards into some really deep experiences. Amazing experience. Cool. Dark think. City, you put it out on the web today. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I kept not really getting a chance to really look at it. But I kept thinking, oh, that looks so cool. Ooh, I'd love to see something from that. <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, want to start with that? you want to start with that? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Very good. Yeah, I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. I'll just mention that, that the movie Dark City is an Australian movie, but it came out some years ago and 
and uh, ever since I saw it, I thought, well, this is like A Course in Miracles made into a full feature-length movie. Um, if, you know, if you were trying to say, well, I can't, it's hard for me to explain it to anybody. Well, if they watched this movie, they would go, whoa. But it's, it's actually quite dark, and then it goes quite light when the whole construct is turned toward the light instead of away from the light. And so it goes from shadows to, in the movie theater, after you've been sitting there for an hour and 40 minutes in the dark, and then all of a sudden this blazing light comes in. It's almost it was like a mystical experience for me to watch that movie. But also I noticed that uh, it came to the first run theaters and it was gone like in three days from the first run theaters. And I said, <clears throat> I thought I could only see Jack Nicholson's face you can't handle the truth. <laughs> and he was saying that to the whole human race. <laughs> like, like this movie is too much. <laughs> you can't handle it, you're not ready for it, and then three days and get it out of there. You know, he, goes like, he goes like, no, get it out of there. I don't even want to, I'm not paying any money to see that movie. But, here we go, Nikita's going to lead off, lead off with a clip from Dark City. Very good. So they went from being very poor in a single room to to having this kind of aristocrat um, discussion. The main thing you you can gain from that clip is that everyone who comes to Earth and everyone who learns through typical history and science and so on and so forth, it seems like Earth was here before we got here, and it seems like our adventure began during birth, or if we use incarnation or reincarnation, past lives. Like it's almost like we come and we dip in for some experiences that become a lifetime. And from a perspective of, of multiple lifetimes, um, it's like you keep returning to the past, still trying to solve something, and, and it's really like an impossible riddle because because time and space are were made by the ego to distract you from seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, to distract you from the kingdom of heaven is within. And the whole point is to go into a state of such depth and stillness through your meditations and through your healing that you come back into the light and remember yourself as an eternal divine being. And from the human perspective, it seems as if things are around us, like there's a world outside of the human being, and there's constantly forces of the world, forces of society, forces of nature, forces of the cosmos that are interacting with us and, and impinging on us. And now, in this day and age, with quantum physics, quantum physics is showing us in science what the mystics have told us for many centuries is that if the world seems like it's external to us, but it's actually, it's just our consciousness. We're just seeing a reflection of our consciousness. So if we don't like star world starvation, world hunger, war, conflict, or even conflict in, in your own family or in your own neighborhood, uh, disease, suffering, pestilence, everything that's experienced in the world is simply a reflection of what's believed in. So, this movie starts to help us have some graphics and see it acted out that we're doing this to ourselves, so to speak, and that the world is is completely subjective. So, no two people see the see the same world because the world that's perceived is just a projection of thoughts. So it's really just one mind asleep and dreaming, it's separate from God and projecting, and it's even projected out bodies and the idea of private minds. So it seems like every human being has their own private little mind that's associated with the body, with their own private thoughts, and that there's there's some communication going on, but, but it's it's pretty tricky. That's why we have so much conflict and more. Psychic conflict, interpersonal conflict, conflict in families, conflict in neighborhoods, in societies, conflict between countries, <laughs> conflict between the, the animal kingdom and the humans. There's just all kinds of conflict and it's all a projection of mind. So, in one sense that's a big leap. Even if you believe in reincarnation, there's still this sense of coming in and out of this world. 
almost like you're a, you're just this soul, and you kind of fly around and go, oh, there's a blue planet there, I'm going to incarnate there. <laughs> and as if you come into the world. There's one lesson in A Course in Miracles, well, Lesson 132, where Jesus says, when you came to this world, you brought the world with you. Now that's getting quantum. Mm -hmm. You didn't come just as a soul who decided to incarnate in some big planet called Earth, or some call it Urantia, if you study that book. Uh, no, when you came, you brought the entire world, the entire cosmos with you. I always tell people, imagine you have a, you're like a soul, you have a soul flying around and you have a little soul backpack. <laughs> and then you pull out of your soul backpack phew, the whole cosmos, just as you believe it and want it to be. So everything that you experience, including even astronomy and astrology and, and planets and black holes and quasars and stars, and the whole thing is just, phew, imagine pulling the whole thing out of your little soul backpack. So, there's no victims because you've, you've set it up exactly the way you believe it to be and you want it to be. There's nothing outside, there's no external cosmos or external people. And all the people, we'll say 7 billion people on the planet now, they're all acting out your mind's wishes. Uh, almost like going to a Shakespeare play, you know, and you watch Macbeth or you watch one of these things, and at the end they all come out, the actors and actresses, and oh, bravo, like, you know, you, you cheer, this act, acted out that drama so well, so well, <laughs> except when we think that's at a theater, when we go back to our family, and our parents or siblings, children start screaming and yelling and fighting, or the cat and the dog start fighting, or whatever, we don't go, bravo, but we could. <laughs> we, they're doing a fine acting job too, and we, we, we could see that as an act as well, just as a reflection of our mind. So in this movie, this clip that Nikita just showed, there's the unconscious mind where there's that big mask, and then behind the mask, when the mask opens up, there's a clock. And time is, is the, the conflict. So. Basically, what this clip is showing is it's the unconscious mind uh, and all those little creatures dressed in black, those are representing in this clip attack thoughts in our mind. Whenever we have attack thoughts and judgments in our mind, we manifest the world using the power of the mind in our judgments. And that's why Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, judge not lest you be judged. Because if you judge, you're just going to witness to your own judgments. And it's just going to be frustrating because it's going to seem like there's someone outside of you that's acting in a way, behaving in a way, doing something that you think, that's not right. And yet, you've chosen that it be that way. In A Course in Miracles, that's the second lesson in the workbook. I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. So imagine that even if we use this example of sitting around in a room tonight watching these movie clips, that if you just look around and you look at the furniture and you look at the room just the way it is, and you look at all these human beings that are in here with us, this is the way the mind wanted it to be. It's, it, you might say that, you know, was this room here and this people here before you got here? Well. You know, you might think, well, the room was here, we, the people just came into it. But no, you, you bring, you, I've given everything I see all the meaning. Every scene we see in the script, every scenario we see, we're constantly projecting meaning. And that's why we need mind training. We need to clear our minds and to release the attack thoughts, release the judgments, because we're going to keep projecting those attack thoughts until we release them. And it gets frustrating, that's why it gets depressing, that's why suicide is the number one cause of death, so to speak, on the planet. It's very frustrating when you keep projecting something and you don't see that you're doing it. You, you think that it's the world's doing it to you and really you're doing it to the world and to yourself. This movie is, is very good at showing the dynamics of that. Uh, you could see all the buildings getting rearranged, the characters, those little needles going in to the forehead as symbol of new memories. And it reminds me of another movie that we have called The Island. 
where they're mixing and matching memories and that. There's a lot of great movies that are really showing the dynamics of what, what the ego is doing, but they could all be summarized in projection, that God doesn't project. Projection is, is described by Jesus as a way of getting rid of something that you do not want by seeing it as outside. And actually, Jesus says, that's how you keep it. You don't get rid of it. The ego tells you, blast them, get it off your chest, tell them what you really feel, give it to them, and then you do, and you go, ah, temporary, ah, and then you feel guilty. Why did I have to say that? Mm -hmm. I could have handled that in a much more tactful way, you know, then all the guilt starts of, why did I do that? Mm -hmm. I could have, I could have not said that, I could have not done that. I, I could have, if I was angry, I should have taken a time out, like children do, <laughs> and, and not, why did I answer the response so quickly and react in that email, and just tell them off, and hit send. I could have just hit draft, and looked at it for <laughs> five minutes, and let the charge go, without actually hitting the send button. But this, the projection works, it just, it, it, that's just the dynamic of the mind, and the ego is saying, get rid of it, but it, we never get rid of it, by seeing it as if it's not us, as if it's outside of us. That's where scapego scapegoating comes in, that's where blaming comes in, finger pointing, is, is believing the cause is outside, and, and wanting evidence to prove that we're right that, about it being external. So forgiveness turns that completely around, and then you can start practicing with every event you go to, every scene in the movie, you can start practicing with this mind training that you're just bringing, you're just giving meaning to whatever you perceive, and that you don't need to do that anymore. The world and you will be much better off if you don't try to read meaning into it. In fact, Jesus kind of gives the hint how important it is in the workbook when he says, when you let the world be a clean slate, you take away all the judgments and meaning that you put on the world, then you make space for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's perspective of the world, which is holistic, it's all, oh, everything's working together for the good, it's, it's this, I, this, feeling of um, that all things be exactly as they are, because they're in a state of divine order. When you don't arrange it, order it, give meaning to it, and, and try to make it be a certain way. We know that works the same way in relationships. If you have a relationship and you keep trying to change the other person to be a certain way, to Sometimes people get married and they think, well, it's, this is not a perfect match, but I can do, I can work on it. Just give me enough years, just give me enough decades and I can make this work out. That's not a good thing, because you're going to get more and more frustrated of starting to see that you can't change other people. And I would say beyond that, you know, the personality self that you actually believe you are, we have all this self-help books and all these programs and all these things you can do, that that even gets stressful. Right. Trying to become a fully functioning person, doing all the self-help books, I mean, when does it end? And, and when is enough enough? And how good is good enough? And so it, it happens with, with diet and mm -hmm. body image and, and fitness and intelligence and going to all kind of these in-services and getting more education and more, 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 it gets to be like a hamster on a wheel, where it's, it's very, very stressful. Yeah. And manifesting, because a lot of times, yeah. we've grown up in an, in an age where there's a lot of talk about manifesting. And manifesting is talked about in, in a, a positive light. Like, did anybody ever see The Secret, read the book yes. or anything? Yeah. Yeah. It's a hugely popular thing. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like, like this is what, you can create your own reality and uh, by golly, you should. You should have a happy, joyful, abundant life and make it the way you want it to be. And it just doesn't quite go all the way. I, I always, uh, many years ago when The Secret came out, I would go around and everybody wanted to talk about The Secret, because it just came out and it was so popular. And I would say, well, 
manifesting does have one good aspect to it because it's starting to bring into awareness the power of the mind. And that's always helpful. It's very empowering to start to begin to have witnesses in the world. Whether it's Sai Baba manifesting jewelry and bracelets, or you know, Wayne Dyer and, and Ram Das kind of got into that a bit, or it's manifesting relationships. I, I actually think I went to Michigan one time and I was doing a gathering probably about 20, almost 20 years ago, and I was talking about the Course, and then this woman came in and everyone said, Oh, she's here, she's here, it's the manifesting lady. And so she was just happy, happy, and then uh, she said, um, announced to the whole group, I'm, they call me the manifesting lady, that's my nickname. I can manifest anything, cars, houses, relationships for people, I can manifest anything, and this and this, and she went on, and so during the, we took a break and had some tea, and, and I said, why don't you, when we come back from the break, you share the full extent of, of all the manifesting miracles you've had for everybody. Because I, I knew that that would be a very powerful thing in, in pointing to the power of the mind, and then I said, I'll take it from there. We'll, we'll go beyond the manifesting, but you, I want everybody just to have a witness of how powerful the mind is, how powerful thought is, in, in terms of thought and form. And she did, and then after that, I kind of took it to the point, well, what if you went through this phase for some days, months, years even, which she had done for years, and you sensed there was something more being able to make anything you want? What if you got a good fill of that, where you could really manifest and manifest and manifest, and, and then you started to realize that there actually was something more that you really wanted besides manifesting, and I called that eternal life, or peace of mind, lasting love, peace, happiness, and joy that, that doesn't fluctuate anymore. And that, that in order to go to that next level, you would have to start to realize that everything that you ma manifested was still part of the past. It was still as if you were using your mind, like these dark ones do, to, to manipulate the images, to bring what you thought were better and better scenarios, and better and better images, and then you started to realize, hmm, maybe I don't even know what better is. Because I've never found eternal life or peace with all this mm -hmm. manipulating of the images. So we took it very, very deep there to see that it's, it's, it's okay. Anything that strengthens your awareness of how powerful your mind is, is good. But it's not the end. And the, the magic of manifesting is just a, is more of an introductory phase. And when you get into A Course in Miracles, he's got his stages of the development of trust. He even has one of his early stages, I think it's number two, he says, things will seem as if they are being taken away from you, not added on to you. <laughs> not ma you're not manifesting more, it's actually taken away. And he said, if nothing's really getting taken away from you, it's just that you're starting to devalue the appearances and the images of the world, because you know that it's, you're after love. You're after an, ex an experience of divine love. You had a question. I had a question. When you say manifesting, is that miscreating, or does fear have to be in there? Because I know when they talk about manifesting, they will use the word creating, but it's not really yeah. creating. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not an eternal creation. Yes. Yeah, it's, that All manifesting is in the realm of miscreation. And that's why it never brings eternal happiness. You know, it may, the ego may go, ooh, ooh, a new diamond ring, ooh, a new car, ooh, a soulmate. I got my, ooh, I really got the big one there. I got a soulmate. And then, until the soulmate, until they disagree. So, oh, okay, that's, that, was, that was a trial. I, I'm going to get the real soulmate. I'm going to manifest the real soulmate. You know, there's always, there's always uh, try again, try again, but it's all within the realm of miscreation. And that's why these kind of movies are really good, because um, this one goes all the way from the darkness. All these... Like, you've can got I just point of? something out? Yes. Very important. Uh, with those two people at the table that, you, that were poor, and then they were all of a sudden uh, time stopped, and then they were rich, that's not a real change. That's mm. like, that's the egoic change, and it goes, fluctuates from pleasure and pain, from 
poor and rich, but they mm. have no awareness with that change. It's just a change in form. They have no awareness that they're stuck and they're in fact in a dark city and they're trapped. And, and so that's, it's like th that serves no value at all. Where like, where the, uh, the main character, he's all like, wake up, wake up. There's something that's like val a value there happening. And he's seeing like, he's going beyond those, like beyond the temporal changes he's going deeper into that like what what is going on what is what is being manifested really like in the mind so he's getting in touch so mm -hmm. yeah well that's a telltale sign of miscreation that positive negative good bad even the rights and wrongs of morality you know you hear all these morality arguments you know this is this is good you're pleasing god you're in god's eyes you're pleasing god. oh that's a sin against god it's it's terrible, you'll burn in hell, you'll punish. All the moral arguments, even ethical things, ethically good, ethically bad, if, if it's all miscreation, then you start, even if you get a hint that it's all part of miscreation, then you say, wow, then there's a whole different shift that has to take place, and I need to be open to whatever that is. And I would say that's the miracle of, of being shown that it's all false, and, and every image of this cosmos is part of the past. That uh, Jesus says at one point, um, history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. It's one of the most amazing quotes. History would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. Then the mind gets real curious about the power of now. It gets curious about the present moment, like, well, there's something really important happening if I keep repeating, like Groundhog Day, you know, Bill Murray, mm -hmm. where he keeps going around playing the same day over, and and learning from some of the nuances, so he he seems to shift. Yeah. The just like you were talking yeah. about, he seems to he he steps in the puddle day after day after day after day until one day he's, he's his leg, his foot is over the puddle, and he he catches it, and he kind of moves it over the puddle, and he happily hops over the puddle. Seems like a a big a breakthrough. No, you know he's still he's still depressed. He's still looking for love with with Rita. He's he's still uh, at some points he gets so depressed he tries to kill himself, electrocute himself, throw himself in front of a bus, over a cliff. You know he tries to do all these things. Like Groundhog Day is a huge. It's a very important movie for us if we're waking up. The Truman Show is another one. You know, yeah. he's he yeah. goes through all this and finally has to come to the exit door, mm -hmm. and then the ego doesn't want him to. Mm -hmm. He says, "No, you're the star." It's like, you, in course terms, you're the hero of the dream. You're the star of the show. I need you to keep playing this part, and and keep mm -hmm. caught up in this whole crazy mess, in order to perpetuate itself. In order for the ego to exist, it needs to keep using the power of the mind for miscreation, and and keep the mind from waking up to true spiritual creation, which we could call the vision of Christ, or the revelations, the great rays, and mm -hmm. those experiences. So, for us, when it comes to what you're talking about, is that, is that it all is in the past, and, and it's also a script that's written, so it's, it's, you get to a point where, in the script, that you've decided in the script that you're going to manifest, manifest, to to show yourself the, the power of the mind. So it, <clears throat> it seems like it's just a kind of a robotic kind of thing that you're going through, as opposed to it's being really creative because the creation happened in the past. Well, not creative, the creation, what we made to get out of the dream was made in the past. Yeah, it's like stuck, stuck in the past, it's believing the past is real. Jesus tells us that this world was over long ago, yeah. that and Jesus has accepted the correction through the resurrection. He says, when I, when I awoke, you were with me. So, those are helpful things to hear too. Not like, uh, somehow we got to really do something significant to get ourselves out. No, it's, it's already happened. It, the world is over. We're just reviewing the past as if it's still happening. Reviewing what's already long over and gone. It's been over and gone long ago, and, and we have a memory problem. We keep pulling the past into the present, 
and covering over our magnificent, spectacular power of now, present moment, with all these old yeah. thoughts. As there's some sick attraction, some belief that the guilt is still there, that the pain is still there, that the fear is still there, and it's not. So, yeah, I think when we go through some of these clips, all we're going to be doing is looking at this very same thing from different angles. Reinforcing to our mind that it's over, and and it was interesting. I had we had lunch with Judy Sketch, uh, Sundari, and and Nikita, and I, and Judy, and Wit, and uh, Wit was so excited because he told us during the lunch that he visited a a friend, a Swedish man who who loved the Course in Miracles and has passed away, but he. He had the Swedish version of the course he would like carry it around with him, but he went into what seemed to be Alzheimer's and uh, he he kept forgetting, forgetting the world more and more and clinging to his Swedish Course in Miracles book and then he could hardly string together sentences anymore. He could hardly put words together at his mind. He started to forget so much, but he hold hold on to this Course in Miracles book, Swedish Course in Miracles book and he could string a few words together. He would hold the book and they would say, what's that? And he'd go, voice of God, voice of God. <laughs> Imagine if you can't string a sentence together, but you can, you can string three words together and go, voice of God, voice of God, voice of God. <laughs> Almost childlike, you know, when children just start off with just with a few words. And then his wife, who could see him regressing back into this state of forgetfulness, where he was forgetting the world, she uh, bought him a big sandbox. And so he was quite up in years, and she was too, and they would go and they would play in the sand, and they would make little things in the sand, and one of the things he would make, he would go, City of God, City of God. <laughs> he could string together City of God and Voice of God, but he couldn't string together a sentence. So Wit couldn't even have a conversation with him. And Wit was going, how fascinating. I think this is getting closer to the real world, to the happy dream. And I had the same thing with my grandmother, Lillian, who she could sing old hymns, and she could talk uh, the 23rd Psalm from the Bible, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. She could say that verbatim, and she wouldn't know who she had lunch with. Her memory was going so fast that she couldn't remember that. And uh, I remember going in there one time, and uh, I could see how happy she was, and I, I decided I would just talk to the whole staff that was working with her in the nursing home. And I got together in a meeting room, and I said, could you do me a favor? I said, don't orient her ever back into time and space. Don't tell her her name. <laughs> don't tell her, her that she's Lillian Hoffmeister. Don't tell her it's this Deer Park nursing home in Cincinnati, Ohio. I said, would you just do me one favor? This is the whole staff there. Don't, don't orient her back to time and space. And they said, oh, we wouldn't think of it. She is our inspiration for being here. <laughs> and so the re she has already drawn forth the reflections of the whole staff. They wouldn't think of, of orienting her back to time and space because they could feel the innocence and the joy of her being there, letting go of the world in joy. You know, not dementia. You know, that's just a diagnosis of the medical model. Of if you see it from an upside-down perspective, where all these so-called human skills and abilities are important, then dementia is like loss. And even family members that perceive it as loss, oh my God, they come out all shaken, they didn't even recognize me, oh I can't believe it, you know. Like, the, it's, it's their own identity <laughs> that they're afraid is getting lost, because a loved one can't recall those memories. It's their own fear. The person usually with dementia is in a good state of mind, and the family is freaked out <laughs> because they feel like they don't recognize me anymore. You know, it's all backwards. So, so what's next? Men about town. Yeah, this is a clip of John Cleese. This is this is John Cleese, and now he's. This is the kind of professor we needed in college, <laughs> or or a teacher in high school. The Professor of the Spirit, because all of our professors in high school and college were having us learn all these meaningless facts from the past. And John Cleese, some of you know from, from Monty Python, you know, he's yeah. going he's gonna to be our Professor of the Spirit. So let's, yeah. let's roll with it. Here. 
that's like a lead-in clip. And then there's another clip where basically they, they do their journals of all these different things that are coming up in consciousness. And when all of this comes up, basically he's going to say, um, I want you to share your journals now, which is kind of like our, I'm always talking about no private thoughts and no private minds and no people pleasing. He wants to sh them all to share it. And Ben Affleck, the young Ben Affleck, is like, well, I'm not comfortable sharing my journal. And he's just very direct with him, like, like I'm here, I'm not an anesthetist, I'm, I'm here to help you with, with the healing. And in other words, saying, you have to share. We have to be able to let it up. We have to let the darkness up in our mind. We can't keep repressed and denied if we expect to actually authentically heal. So he's very direct about that. And then at some point, the, the Ben Affleck will, will say, um, well, he's only had two years of junior college and everything, and he tells the teacher, uh, John Cleese, I think education can only take you so far. And John Cleese goes, quite right. It can, but ego, as he puts on the blackboard, <laughs> can only take you so far. It will not get you anywhere. Uh, it may feed you and clothe you, but it will leave you cold and alone. And and he takes you all the way in in these just these clips that we pull from that movie to that you have to know who you are. You have to know your original self. You know, and the, which is pointing back to the spirit. Because the Spirit created us perfect in this whole construct. Oh, here's, here we go. There's more people coming. It's, the Spirit is really taking it step by step to just help loosen the mind from all of these thoughts and all of these false identities and all of these self-concepts that are so protected. And it's so, the ego is so clever that even if you get on the, the journey, the ego will turn you then into a spiritual seeker, as long as you can hold on to the identity of being a spiritual seeker and not a finder, mm -hmm. or a discoverer, or an experiencer. And, and uh, the ego, it says in the Course, the ego enjoys studying itself. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's almost like becoming an identity of a spiritual student. Or you could say a spiritual teacher, they call it spiritual ego, where the teacher you know, gets so caught up into the teaching and students, and still doesn't have the breakthrough experience of, of the love and the oneness that's in there. It gets all hung up on that. Okay, we'll open it. Any more questions? Yes. Um, so I've been studying the Course for like a year and a half, um, but what, if, what advice would be for you, for, for me, um, I started my career like five years ago and I had, I feel like I had so much ego, like identity, like I'm a hair color specialist, I'm, I'm an independent woman, all this, and like all of a sudden it's like a year and a half I'm studying the course and I'm like, how come I don't have any clients now? Why is everything just like stripping away from me? And I'm like forgetting everything all of a sudden. I'm like, is this normal for people who are studying the course? And like, what would be your best advice to just like, keep going, especially for like, you know, a younger woman like me, you know, I'm, I'm a new mom, I have a baby that's, um, let's see, he's almost seven months, and mm -hmm. a new spouse as well, mm -hmm. and it's all just like, how do I keep going without like, wanting to give up, it's like I have like, suicidal thoughts, but I know like, well that's not going to work, because I'm just going to have a different reality, so. Yeah, well it's, there is a part of the Course where it says, from this point on you will not go on alone. Mighty companions go with you. So in other words, you know, as you described your earlier life, and where you're just studying and opening and achieving, and, and it's part of like an empowerment as a, as a person, as a young woman, empowering which to the world is kudos, you know, that's a good step. Instead of being a dependent one, dependent on the family and dependent on the government and mm -hmm. whatever, you're, you're advancing in the world's terms and then you start to study the Course and it's like, uh-oh, this, this is like a game going on here. Like, I'm caught up in a game here and I thought all along I was progressing, but now 
I'm getting the sense that, that that's, that's not what the real progression is. I often say, too, uh, that, that this world's backwards and upside down, so, so the more successful you are in the world's terms, you're twice removed from reality. It's like moving away from, from eternal life instead of trying to move toward it. So when people go through 12 steps or addictions or they have these suicidal thoughts and everything and they drop to their knees where they just go, this is getting really intense, Jesus or God, Spirit is getting super intense, what am I going to do here? That's when you open up and you start to realize that you will not go on alone. You will have contacts, you will find the books you need, you will meet the people you need. Um, I've been at this for like um, 30 years with the Course, and 25 of it, a quarter of a century, has been just moving around the planet. And so every week, I get people writing to me with what you're sharing. Um, they'll say, like my friend Ricky, you know, she was in Nashville, hold up. She was a, a rock star. She'd been a rock star and successful, not emotionally, but to the world, you know, yeah. successful. <laughs> And then she, she's in a motel with a course book and her dog uh, keeps reading and, and things start to fall away. The more she reads the course, the more she prays, calls on help, and the more, it's just her and her dog. She, she's like, she starts writing to me, I can't even get a waitressing gig. I could always sing at some of these places because she's got such an amazing voice and do waitressing, but it's like the doors are like going like this now. What is happening? It's like the doors aren't opening, the doors are, are closing. Mm -hmm. I had another friend, Donna Marie Carey, an amazing voice too, like a Joan Baez kind of voice, and she got into the course, and she used to be able to go do you know, gigs all over the place in bars and sing, 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 and then she started to go to Nashville. She said, oh, I got in touch with Amy Grant's publishing company, and she's like thinking, okay, my career is ready to take off as a singer, because she's got the talent. And she's got the drive and everything, and then boom, here comes the doors start closing. Like, what is going on? This is not the way. I thought dreams come true in all those fantasies, you know, those fairy tales, what's going on? Like with Ricky, she just wrote an email to me, and she just said, what is going on here? She said, there is some kind of a, a transformation or something that, that I need to know about, and what am I going to do? And I said, well, how's your situation? She said, I've got some guitars, I, I want to sell some guitars, I want to visit my family, and if it's possible, I would like to go and come out and just join with you, because I'm getting into... So, um, so the good thing to know is, I mean, I just told this the other night too, because I, had a, I get these calls and these things. There's actually a young man who's 23 from Portugal, and He's been following this, the Course and the teachings, and he's going into these mystical experiences, but coming back into very painful experiences in the body, mm -hmm. and losing all five senses. All five senses are like blowing out of his life, and he's just like, please just tell me, love's not abandoning me, you know. It was yeah. the same kind of thing. It's, if it's more an extreme example, and then, yeah, I, I talked with him, and, and um, Oh, that was probably four or five days ago, but there are steps coming in now where where he is going to come over and and come into a context where he'll be surrounded by people who have gone through, down through the keyhole with this. And so, instead of having those reflections of, what are you doing with your life, and, you know, the doubt thoughts, it's it's more opening in a, in a kind of a quick way to, okay, I need support here, Spirit, because how is this going to go? I have, I have a child, a seven-month child. You know, oftentimes the ego will say, well, you know, your circumstances aren't good for <laughs> spiritual awakening. But the circumstances, it's not a matter of circumstances, it's about when the mind's really ready to start to, to go through this awakening, this empowerment in the mind, then then it shows up. Even these movie clips, now we, we're putting a lot of really deep teachings like this, like what I'm doing right now, on a website, an online website called MWGE, Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment, MWGE.org, 
and and there's even like emotional indexes in there when you are going through specific emotions you can zoom into those emotions and it recommends movies to help carry you beyond those emotions to kind of lift you out with the spirit's help mm -hmm. so there's really it's an enormous amount of tools and resources available but the most important thing is is the faith to say wow i i've just drawn, drawn the witness of the course into my life and this witness is part of my awakening and and my receiving the symbols that i need to go on, just like if you had been in university and you need certain symbols to go through and to graduate through that, this is like a more of a, a spiritual awakening curriculum that's there. Mm -hmm. But you're not alone. There's just an enormous amount of help. And it will all just come rushing to you as you acknowledge it. Thank you. Great, yes. Well, I have a similar question. This just has to do with trying to quicken the process in terms of ideas and beliefs and concepts that I have that are hidden to me at this point. And what's been happening is just they kind of unfold for a period of time and then I get something I understand and it becomes something that I no longer value and it kind of dissolves. And so I just wanted to find a way that would help to quicken that process. Well, it's, I think, like I was saying with these tools, I think it's this celestial speed up, or when I come together with people and we, we join very, very deeply, um, the doubts and the reservations have to be allowed to surface. There has to be just a safe context for that to come up. Almost like if you had like a a, a spiritual psychotherapist or some or some kind of a guide or prophet or seer or mystic in your life and uh, a lot of people that I know have gone and they've received amazing readings just at the point where they're going whoa what's happening one of them was was even Judy Scutch uh, she just was telling me that she got to a point you know in her life where she felt so, kind of like she was coming closer to completion with everything and yet, there was something where this reading came in and said, there's a lawsuit coming. So she knew about the lawsuit involving A Course in Miracles before it, it came through a reading. But sometimes, you know, it can make all the difference if, if that guidance comes through in a timely way. It's like Jesus saying, Holy Spirit will go before you, making straight your path and leaving no stones to trip on, no obstacles to bar the way. If you keep pace with Spirit, in terms of your willingness and openness, then you receive the information that you need to help calm the mind during this big transition. And it's like the world's upside down from the ego, so you imagine the whole world tilting and going right side up. You know, that to the ego, that's a t very tumultuous turn because it's so invested in everything being upside down. It doesn't want right side up. <laughs> it doesn't want everything to go to love and light. It wants to, to keep it in fear and guilt. So, I, my advice always is just avail yourself of all the support. Um, I was just in Southern California and we were there and this young group of people invited us up on the top of the mountain and people started showing up and came and I mentioned the other night one woman came and she'd just been jilted. Her fiancé had just left her two weeks before the wedding and she was emotionally, but by the end of the weekend she was like Mother Willow, Grandma Willow. She was like the wise, well if he does contact me I would love to share these insights that I've gained, you know, all sense of abandonment, all sense of grief, all the stuff, you know, in one weekend, I popped because she was so open to avail herself of all the support that was there. Oh, she soaked it in. She soaked it in really good. She was quite uh, stable and, and confident, actually, and open after the weekend because she was so willing to accept the support and embrace it and move on. And I think that's the key.
That's the key. Okay, let's use Ira, Ira and Abby because that's that relates to these last two questions about. It's a movie called Ira and Abby, and and here are two people in the movie. Um, Ira's just been in therapy for twelve years, for 12 years <laughs> and and doing like with psychoanalysis where you just keep going over. In fact, the, the therapist can't stand to hear another word. Um, <laughs> Out of out of Ira, the, he's so frustrated at he's basically he's let Ira go and said, "Listen, this isn't helping you. It isn't helping me. It isn't helping any of us." And then he's going to go into like a a, a fitness center where Abby works, and then they actually spend the day talking, and then this scene is going to come after they have spent pretty much the day talking and sharing from the heart. <coughs> and this is a great scene because we'll, this will trigger a lot of things, but it will, it will, we'll be able to go at yeah, the celestial speed up from also this. Also, being able to do that question, how to fasten it, like, mm -hmm. how, like the way to speed it up. It's like this. Uh, this this is, is, it. is it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's an amazing movie. They do get married. And it, everything in this movie is such a speed up with relationships. Mm -hmm. All the things that people seem to take years, decades, lifetimes to go through, it's all in there. And then you have the therapist, there's a number of therapists that are involved, and the movie ends pretty much with all the therapists all sitting around, because it's just so spectacular. They just break through all the relationship issues. Really, if you just thought of yourself, the only reason you're here is to learn to forgive and to make it through these relationship lessons. And if you could have the crash course, if you could have it all compacted, instead of having to string it out over long, long, long periods of time, wouldn't that be great? Well, that we did show this movie, and uh, I think I showed it in Mexico recently, and there was a bunch of couples in the room where I was, and they were just ooing and aahing, all these married couples, married for 20, 30, 40 years, just, oh, oh my, oh my God, <laughs> you know, because it, it's just, it's that speed up. And she was just very, very direct and intuitive, you know, he was very intuitive to read her completely about what her life was all about, and then she just came right in with, you want to get married, uh, because he was so intuitive. <laughs> And she wanted something like that. And and then all the temptations to blame, all the temptations with exes. She had two uh, ex-husbands in the movie and and when they enter into the picture, you know, it brings up his insecurities, but he's got to move through all of that. And uh, she's even spending time with one of the exes just out of love to heal him. There's even a scene on a subway where um, um, they're they just got married, I believe, and yeah. they, and they're on the subway, and this man comes, and he pulls out a gun, and he's he wants money from the people on the subway, and she gets up out of her chair, as he's saying, "Don't move," you know. I was saying, "Just stay here, stay here." She goes up, and she just is so direct and open with the man, and she's just right, seeing his call for love. It's, he's just in fear, and she just goes right to him and says, how much money do you need? And he comes up with a number, and she goes around to everyone in the subway to get the money, comes back to him and says, I think we've got it. Is this going to be enough? And he's like, well, actually, that's more than I need, actually. Honestly, the guy with the gun <laughs> says, and she's just, in her miracle working functions, well, meanwhile, Ira's just, Terrified that oh my god I've just married a woman who's <laughs> who walks right up to somebody with a gun without fear <laughs> and she's just the love is just pouring through her so it's such a healing movie but it just gives you a little glimpse about hmm what would my life be like if I could be that open and direct with everyone in my life if I had the confidence 
to just say what I need to say, like with you, with your son David. If you were so radiantly confident to be able to sit down and said, I'm not going to string this out over seven, ten years, or whatever, what's going on. I, you know, the love is, is here with us now, and, and we're going to sit down without fear and, and come and let the love bring the resolution. Because it's an identity thing, you know, it's, we're, when we're clinging to an identity and we believe that there's something or someone outside of us that, that we need to complete us, like a lot of the fairy tales, you know, Cinderella and Prince Charming and all those fairy tales we've had where there's something external that's going to complete us, the, the, the more quickly we can get to the point of facing things in our own psyche, in our own consciousness, and coming to that circle of completion, then everything and everyone around us is going to reflect that wholeness and completion. And it's going to be easy, it's going to be fun, it'll be a joyful life. I saw a bumper sticker years ago, because when I was much younger I would see these bumper stickers, life's a bitch and then you die. Yeah. And then I saw this bumper sticker one day, when my mind was waking up, and it said, Life's a joy, and then you ascend. Yeah. And I went, Oh my God, that's my, that's my philosophy of life on the bumper sticker. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's where this is all heading. It's heading into openness, uh, full communication, and then on into communion with the Source, where you're just being sourced every second, every minute, and you're living out of that joy and that love, and therefore everything around you is just reflecting that in a very natural way. Like of, of, you, you just feel it. Like it, of course, of course, so it's that if, way. If enough of us were doing this in the world right now, in our own personal lives, such would be reflected in the world in terms of the universe that we perceive. I mean, it would go outward. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not even kind of like a hundredth monkey thing in, in the sense that I said earlier, like Jesus completed his part completely, so, so that, that has actually happened. He's, he reached the real world or the happy dream in which the whole thing reflected this perfection. And so within time, from the human perspective, it's like it can seem like a hundredth monkey thing, like if enough, of, if enough humans do this, but it's actually it's it, it's even simpler than that. It just it just takes doing your part completely. Okay, so a way to approach because there's been a lot of publicity, you know, in recent um, months, especially about the Syrian war and so forth, and prayer vigils that are being held and so forth. Is that an appropriate um, direction to take? having prayer vigils as such for peace? Or is it just as effective or more effective to simply concentrate on our own peaceful state of mind and our own healing? Each but individual, as we look at Brown, we see individuals, but you know what I'm saying, individual by individual. And that's yeah, the, that's if, you, if you, I remember in the early years when I was going through a lot of things and had all those questions. I remember it was Jesus speaking to me like a broken record. It was he was always saying, "It's your lesson, it's your lesson, it's your lesson." It's like a broken record. Your lesson, your lesson, your lesson. I'd be like, "But, but, 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 but you know, no, your lesson, your lesson." So, there are mystics, for example, like um, Joel Goldsmith, uh, who was called upon when they had like a, a big, um, I think it was a big railway strike. Um, things that seem to be even societal. We're not just talking about praying for somebody who seems to have symptoms for their health and well-being, but societal things, world events and so forth. The key is, is starting to realize, the faster you can realize this one thing, the faster it's, it's happening. And that is that it's a perceptual problem. So. So, it's tempting to look out and to see, well, this is happening in Syria, or this is happening in Ethiopia, and this is happening over there in China, and to see this kind of big global thing, when actually it's, it's a perception that there are problems that, that are sore spots, problems in the world, problem areas, and oftentimes people will put a lot of effort into uh, like world events and changing things on that those kind of scales, and yet 
for their own psyche, <laughs> they don't put the the effort in, or within their own relationships, their own family. So, if you can start to realize that it's a perceptual problem, in other words, what does that even mean? Well, perception, as I was sharing earlier, per projection makes perception. So, this entire world, uh, this entire cosmos is a hallucination. So we've got some major schizophrenia uh, going on here, not a few people, uh, thousands of people locked up in psychiatric institute. We're, we're talking the human condition is a schizophrenic condition. We are, we are hearing multiple voices. There's seven billion multiple voices going on, not just like Sybil, a few different personalities. We've got seven billion personalities going on. We've, there's multiple personality disorder. We've had a psychotic break from reality. We've got psychosis going on at a grand scale. We've got schizophrenia going on. And when you start to bring it back to consciousness, you go, whoa, it's, the problem is in consciousness. It's not specific. It's not world poverty. It's not w war as we would see it. That's why there's no political solution. I know a lot of times, uh, I, I was in Sadari's house, was it a couple of days ago, and and someone was bringing up the elections, this is an election year and politics and so forth, and in the span of 10 minutes, we handled all of politics and sexuality and nutrition <laughs> in 10 minutes. How can you handle those? My God, those are three big topics a lot of guilt and shame, except through seeing that it's a perceptual problem. And that's key. Like if you went to any kind of 12-step program, anybody who, who's done 12 steps or even knows of the 12-step programs knows that if you're in a state of denial about the problem, the drinking, the cocaine, the, the food, the sex, whatever, if you're in denial about the problem, you're not even close to healing. I, you know, I've got no problem. No problem. Oh, I drink, but I have a problem. I, I drink a lot, but that's not a problem, or whatever. It's, it's hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. Why do they even start off with going around the room with hands going up and an admission? Uh, my name is so-and-so, and, -so and I, I'm an alcoholic. So I say, for Course in Miracles students, they need to do that. They should do that with every course meeting. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I have a perceptual problem. Uh, they should, they really should, because how else are you going to begin? Think about it. People show up at the course meetings and they're still like, Oh, I've got relationship problems, I've got some financial problems, I'm upset at the way the, the environment's going, you know. I've got all these projections of all these problems, you know. Oh, I have an allergy problem. Oh, I, I have a... a blood sugar level problem, oh, I have a, an impotence problem, oh, I have, you know, blah, 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 oh, yada, 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 yada. No, 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 you don't. It's a perceptual problem. You're seeing something that doesn't even exist. That's a hallucination. Start there. <laughs> Wake up in the morning, if you open your eyes and, the, and your ceiling's there, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. What's your problem? It's the ceiling. I still see a ceiling. Okay, now now we're getting somewhere. Why? Because I have a perceptual problem. I, I'm, I'm hallucinating. I'm seeing something that isn't even there, that God didn't even create. You know, I'm, I'm seeing something that's so twisted and distorted. And, and then I'm, st I'm also seeing all these specific problems when really there aren't specific problems. That's another trick, to make all these thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of problems, when really there's only one problem, and that problem's already been solved. Uh, you know, so that's, that's where it's a psych psychological, it's a perceptual problem. If the problem's already been solved, and you're still experiencing many problems every day, then that's, that's a serious condition. Um, not in reality, but it's something that has to be addressed in the mind. So that's what I would say. I mean, I have a friend, Jimmy Twyman, and he was just doing the, the prayers over there. And he worked with the Course for years, but he started doing a Course in Miracles because he, he slipped away from his practice with the Course. That's why he did a Course in Miracles. Why did he sing all those lessons? Because he, he, he drifted away from his practice. You know, he made movies, Moses Code, and 
you know, just he, he did a number of things in some community experiments and this and this, but but we're the course is a is a very important system of clearing your mind in a systematic way. And you have to apply it, you have to practice the lessons for it to work. You know, if you put it on the shelf for a few years, it's you know, then you're you have arrested development. <laughs> it's an arrested awakening if you kind of put your practice aside. So he did that to get back into his practice. And I would say that, yeah, that's the most important thing. It's not so much where you go or what you do or trying to draw attention to it. I've even had people said, you know, David, we could really help save the planet if we could just get a copy of the Course in the Pope's hands. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know? They said, well, one guy said, I was close. I got really close. I was only like seven feet away from the Pope and I had the book in my hand to give it to him and then he was assassinated. This was Pope John Paul. He was shot. <laughs> I've got seven feet away from him, I think. And then another one said, I snuck it in the Vatican. It's it's in the Vatican library. It's like, well that's not going to do any good. A course book in the Vatican library. There's a lot of books in the Vatican library, you know. How about your own perception? <laughs> Doing the lessons, you know. People get into all kinds of these missions, you know. <laughs> and it's not that. And we don't have to get into those missions. We're not trying to save the world. We have our clip. Can, can oh, I, sure. Because um, this is funny. This I, I completely a hundred percent related to that woman, mm -hmm. and and it, it it brought up for me what I felt like my question that I brought here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I I feel like the entirety of my existence is is a hunger in a way for where I'm next joining and um, do you know I'll go in a party I'll scan the room for the men or I'll sit there in meditation this morning thinking oh my gosh who can I join with on my birthday who can I there's this um, and it's very it's funny it's not even you know, I, I've been married till death do us part and the whole thing. I mean, it's not like I'm looking for that. I like how you said that the other day. And I've been married and uh, da da da. You said <laughs> <laughs> she puts a da 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 after <laughs> whatever it was because it's almost like you're, you're searching for something and it's on to the next. It, it's constant. It's constant mm. in my it, and it feels bigger than just ego. It feels like part of my functioning. And it feels, you know, on one level it's just separation itself. And but on another level there's something there's something that's the flow and purpose of my life in it. And th there was a moment at your group the other night where uh, some a guy I know was sitting next to me mm -hmm. touched my hand and through the energy of it, it felt uh, it, it, it's someone who is in into the modality of being forgiving, mm -hmm. where, where you can feel the joy mm -hmm. that they get in the giving, mm -hmm. and the the and it's so big for me right now. The mm -hmm. just the energetic feeling, and, and what I felt was complete peace. I mean, there I was listening to you, and it was like complete lack of uh, lack. Yes. <laughs> uh, mm. um, just like total, total satisfaction at feeling this an energetic connection of forgiving, and um, there was something about her hunger that that felt like the same almost constant intensity in my beingness on every level all the time, and I wondered if you could. You know, I don't have much clarity on that, but it's so palpable in the matrix of my own energy front that it's yes. in a funny way everything. Yes. Well, the key to that, like, it's almost like there's this something that's inside you that just wants to expand and just ready to burst open in inclusiveness and 
helpfulness and vastness and everything. And really the key to it is, is loosening from all associations, all past associations, which would be loosening from all investment in the past. Complete loosening. Almost like, a, like when a, a, an artist comes and gets a fresh canvas. You know, it's got all the palette of colors. You, you really, really need a, that blank slate. You need to be able to come to a fresh, new opportunity with every moment. And so, that's how we become truly helpful and truly able to be used by Spirit, is when we loosen from the past. And that means, let go of, of all false past associations around everything, around the body, around security, around uh, thinking that my past learning has taught me enough at least to know how to survive. That's one of the, the biggest blocks to spiritual awakening, is the mind is so convinced that it's learned how to survive on planet Earth. Um, through working, through saving, through spending, through intelligence. You know, for me, I had 10 years of university, and uh, so I learned all these skills and abilities, and I got degrees, and all the typical things, you know, that people go through a lot of education and a lot of skill development for, so that you can navigate time and space in a, in a helpful way, and survive. <laughs> So if, as long as survival is even in there from the past learning, that that survival instinct, they call it, which is still ego, it's all, it's, ego. it's all ego, it's all tied into the body, all of that has to go. And the ego will start to scream if you start to let go of some of it. Like, oh, you're going to be dependent now, you're going to be, in, you're going to be dependent on other people, and you're going to be, when I was going through this dismantling, the ego was like, you're going to end up like a bag lady. You're going to end up hope, homeless, you know. Ten years of university and you're going to be a good-for-nothing, out-on-the-streets bum. And, and then, of course, I even had some of those reflections from my biological father, when he would get upset at, I was letting go of everything. It would be a like, no good, dirty, rotten, bum, get a job. You know, I got those witnesses. That was just doubt thoughts in my own mind about trusting spirit. You know, like Mother Teresa kind of thing, like St. Francis. You know, we've had some pretty good symbols throughout throughout history that have just said, okay, I'm going to trust. I'm going to God and I trust that God will provide. And they put it right into action. But this isn't even a personal thing. It's not like it's, oh, it was great. Like St. Francis had the rays of God shining on him and Mother Teresa had the rays of God. And then the rest of the billions, <laughs> trillions, not so. They've got a struggle to, to live. The ones that have, like a couple had, like the Truman Show, where the rain just comes right down on him, you know, like the divine providence. No, it's actually a divine law that you're to be happy and to wake up, and that everything's to be provided, without your effort uh, in this awakening. Like, the, look at the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor toil. And, and even Solomon is not clothed as such as these lilies. And then in the Course, you know, once you have accepted his plan as the one function you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you. Without your effort, he will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on, and no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing, except the only purpose that you would fulfill. So that purpose is so vibrant, that's like a light that's in your heart. It's so vibrant, it's like getting back into the homing beacon, back into the tractor beam with God. Just getting connected back into that light, and then everything. You need words to speak, they're spoken for you. Some of you know that story of Yogananda where he went and he had to speak to a whole crowd, and he didn't even speak the language, so he just stayed in prayer with his guru, his inner guru, and then the, the whole talk came out in the language that the people could hear. That has to come from within. You can't just call on your 
your smartphone, Rosetta Stone, and try to, you know, there's no way Rosetta Stone is going to give you a whole talk. You need the divine guidance. You need to be tuned into the source. And when you are, everything is taken care of. Everything is orchestrated. So the best thing to do is, to, when you start to feel that energy, like you have a big mission, like a huge mission, it's, your part is essential for the plan of atonement, and you can feel it, then the only interference comes in is, is where there's beliefs in, I personally need to take care of certain things. It's almost like dividing your life up into, okay, I'll give this to you, God, and this and this, and I take this and this and this. And Jesus says, well, actually it's the, your main problem is you still believe you need to run some aspects of your life on your own. The more you can say, you take it all, shh, you take it all, then you can be used in the most glorious way. But, but it's past learning, you know, that, that tells us that we have personally become empowered, or that we, pers we have personal skills, personal abilities, or that we're even in charge of the body. It's like a, a forgetting, you know. I, I felt like, um, like the Spirit was constantly telling me, Jesus was just telling me, you know, you need to let go of thinking you're in charge. You need, because he said, because I'm in charge, you need to let go of trying to control people and situations and even your own body. He said, give that to me. He said, don't you try to make that body survive. You know, it will be perfectly useful. As, as long as it's necessary, and then it will be just gently laid aside, like taking off a sweater or a shirt. You know, when it's when it's done, it'll be that easy. You just take it off, and it's done. What did that mean? Well, yeah, I believed in a lot of things. I believed in exercise. I I was part of like you know, I would go to a health club. I played baseball. I played basketball. I played football. I played tennis. I, you know, I was very much into cardiovascular fitness and everything. I had a lot of beliefs in there about exercising the body and keeping the body healthy. And yeah, then about 20, 25 years ago, he's just basically saying, you need to give that to me. You need to give that exercise belief to me. So I did, and I haven't had one thought about exercise. I just don't think about exercise. Back then, before I did that, I had a lot of fear, because I thought, well, if I don't exercise, then the muscles will atrophy. No, they haven't. I look at this. I still can move. I still go travel around to 41, or 44 countries and it still works fine. The puppet works fine without exercise, without thinking of it. Letting go of nutrition, too. That's a concept. It's, it was great when I kept traveling around and, and I said, okay, what am I supposed to be, a vegetarian? Or you want me to eat meat? Or what, you know, what exactly is going to be my diet? He said, well, eat what is served. Eat what is served. Oh, thank you. Well, that's a real easy one. Especially you go to all these countries and cultures and people love you and they take you in and they feed you the food that they've got. Just in this home too. Yeah. Diane went out and she, she bought all kinds of things. Drinks and vegetables, sausage. You know, all kinds of cheese and all kinds of things, and, and that's part of your hosting. She has never hosted before in this way, so this is a whole new experience. But, but that's different from having a whole set of past learning on what's, how to eat healthy. You know, eat what's served <laughs> doesn't sound like it fits into some kind of a box. You know, you, it, it takes a lot, a lot of flexibility. That's actually letting go of a lot of nutrition stuff, you know, when you travel. And it's the same with a, a number of things, you know, you, you, you just want to be as open, an, as open of a vessel as possible from the past. And then, the thing that you love the most, which is, here I am, I'm on call to go anywhere, do anything, whatever serves the whole, that's where you feel the swirl of energy, that's what you love the most. To just be able to whatever, go somewhere, hop on a plane, do whatever's asked, don't ask questions, love everyone, see the Christ in everyone, here's my house, use it, Lord, you know, that's the, 
that's where you keep the joy going, you keep the vibrancy going. It's only past learning that, that ever blocks us. Okay, welcome to our new people where you come right in if you we No, no, perfect. It's perfect. We just watched a few clips, one Dark City, Man About Town. Do you have any any others coming or there's the more on Dark City? That was the movie um of we've talked a lot about projection, about about how we seem to come to this world, and the world seems to be here before we get here, but it's not. We bring, we bring the whole world with us. Jesus says, when you came to this world, you brought the whole world with you. We, we it's more than pick your parents. We pick the black holes. We pick the stars. We pick the molecules. That's the electrons. next one on the mix and match memories. From okay. there, he realizes that it's all like injected. He doesn't even know, like if he was really a like a little boy or not, or like he, he starts to get like, not really confused, but more like unconfused, that it's like something is like not real here. So, so that's good, it's, it's starting to reverse this idea that we're a product of our environment. You know, there's, there's whole schools of thought. You're a product of your past, you're a product of your DNA, you know, your mm -hmm. genetic history. You know, people will sit down and say, well, I have I have a, a genetic disease that's been in my family for so many generations and it sometimes skips this and this and this. That's all the belief that your past determines who you are. Or I was raised in such, uh, at, during the depression or during these experiences with Vietnam or I had these sexual experiences or my parents were like this. As if our parents or our siblings or our environment shape us. No. Our mind, our consciousness projected all of that, so we have complete responsibility for the turnaround. Well, and if you say you just let it go, <laughs> is that literally the case? Do you just think of this limited concept that you're holding on to and you just let it go? Or is there a process that you have to go through in order to let it go? Well, my process was with a course where it became pretty clear the more I worked with the Course, it was like, oh, Jesus is calling me to be a miracle worker. Hmm. Never thought of that. Never talked to my parents about, oh, I think I'll grow up to be a miracle worker. <laughs> um, what's the salary? I, I just don't know. Um, uh, what are the perks? Don't know. It's uh, all new. Uh, or even in high school, guidance counselors, you know, they, they, you have all these things to select from Miracle worker is not usually on most of the list. You know, here's my SAT score. Do I qualify for a miracle worker? Can I can I get in there and everything? No. So for me, it was on the one hand, I'm opening up to whatever this is, working miracles, and and being used by spirit and Christ for the good of the whole, and. This other concept is teacher of God. You know, what does that even mean to be a teacher of God? We're teaching all the time. It's by our attitude to, to learn to purify our heart and be a demonstration of love across the board with everyone, everything, at all times. That's kind of the positive of where it's going. And then what you find in order to go in that direction is you have to unlearn everything. You have to unlearn everything, all the programming, all the conditioning. It's very introspective, I think. Um, I was very much like Gandhi. I was like I was very shy, but there, and both Gandhi and I both said, you know, well, this shyness is like a curse. It doesn't help you with dating. It doesn't help you with social situations. Shyness is it seemed like a curse. It actually was kind of a blessing because I was kind of pondering, what's it all about? What? Where is this all heading? And and do I even want to get caught in the rat race? that I have to extract myself from, or is there some way to start to be shown what is the rat race, before I get too enmeshed in it. And so, it was a process of praying and asking, be, show me, lead the way. And I think the only thing different about my process, so to speak, than most, it's not really different at all, but it's that after I read the course from starting in 1986 for about two and a half years, for about eight hours a day, 
I was saturating my mind with these teachings from Jesus, that suddenly Jesus was speaking to me. And so I had a direct connection with Jesus' voice. Go here, go here, do this, stop that, don't do that anymore. <laughs> you know, I need the, okay, here, this is, you know, it was like an ongoing um, dialogue, ongoing commentary. Even when I would go to course groups, or I'd go here to course teachers, Jesus was gone, commenting, 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 instructing, instructing, instructing. It was very, very helpful in that sense, because, because it was a time saver. We all know that if, if we could just tune into our intuitive voice, that would be a huge time saver. Imagine that your intuitive voice, which knows you're good in any situation, is just in there telling you, you know, oh, you need to do, you need to call so and so. You know, what have I got to say? I'll tell you when you call. <laughs> just, you need to call. That was like a part of a big speed up of basically listen, follow, listen, follow getting into the, the humbleness of that. David, how is the hearing different than the seeing? That's a sense. You know, if you say you saw Jesus, how is that different than hearing Jesus? Because if her, you know, like, if you see something, you know, um, it's just another, it's just part of the dream. It's just part of the ego or something. I don't know. How is that um, different? Well, I think the hearing, it wasn't like an audible hearing, but it was like an inner inner knowing. train of thought mm -hmm. and a knowingness with it, like a strong sense of knowing. But but the seeing, the perceiving in the world, um, it's very much like Helen Shuckman, she, when sometimes when she would have a question, she would like close her eyes or she would go in her mind and she would see it written like on a chalkboard or sometimes in a blazing set of lights, she, she would literally see the word, like if she would go back and say, this word doesn't seem right, she would just see it, and then she would make the correction. So, so that's the way it started to me before I was getting this stream of thought from Jesus. I didn't have that at the beginning. I was so open though to bumper stickers, billboards, I was literally seeing the signs and symbols around me, a lot. So I was like tuning in to those signs and symbols. And I took that as, as like instruction too, like a song on the radio, like I could just drive along and then have pray, and then seemingly just click the radio on, and then it would start singing me the, the instructions and the answers, you know, on the radio. Going to the library, of course I used the course as kind of an oracle, but then after a while I thought, let's try this out in the library. So I just walked through the rows of books, say, okay, here's my questions. Stop, reach over, pull a book off the shelf, open it up, and there it is. Oh, it's like, it's not just in the Course. It's, it's all of perception can reach me, the Spirit can reach me through the symbols, through dreams. Dream symbology, that was another big one. So, to me there was, I always thought of what I could perceive with my eyes, or, or hear, with my ears, as just symbols, dream symbols. And, um, you know, sometimes it's, there's just a, such a strong witness. Sometimes, I kind of did it like, uh, it was kind of a, it seemed like a very much of a solo journey. Like, just tuning into spirit and really saying, lead me, guide me, show me. Some children have invisible friends, I had invisible Jesus. Mm -hmm. But right there with me, that knowingness, that care, that nurturing, very, very helpful. Built my confidence. Then I would follow what he was saying to do, and then it would be so joyful. And I thought, this is good. I need. That's why I need to follow. I can't just listen and not do it. I want to listen and follow, because that's where, that ignites the, the joy, that ignites the confidence. So it wasn't so much a difference like that. Some people do have apparitions right, and so appearances. That's what I'm asking you. Yes. So since childhood, I have seen people and um, and uh, lights. And Gary Renard talks about the lights. Yeah. And I've uh, I'm I kind of I kind of taken a lot of comfort from that because 
it seems like there's something very much beyond and that whole like I could probably in this part of my life have a big just question mark on me like <laughs> I don't know what it, all this is about so um, and I'm finding a lot of comfort in that um, but sometimes I wonder well like when I see the lights they come it feels like a like a, I'm on the right track somehow or another. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a validation or something. And then, I, but I kind of wondered, are those even you know what it, what is what is that what is that about you know what is seeing the people about what is getting the message about I'm not get I don't, it doesn't it doesn't look the person doesn't look like Jesus it looks like different people yeah. they look like different people. Yeah, I think it's it's this thing that the Spirit can reach us in so many ways and at the beginning I wasn't getting a direct sense of, of uh, instruction so I was seeing it in the signs and symbols but then I had to be ready so that when the, like the inner voice was activated that I was ready to follow it and go with it. For example, one of my friends she told me that she was trying to get in touch with her spiritual guidance and just like um, David Hawkins talked about kinesiology and and sometimes people have like pendulums and everything, different things. She was using like the pendulums. She would ask the pendulum questions and it would move and yes and no and so she was like, instead of seeing lights or people or in my case hearing a voice, she was using this pendulum. And she used it, used it, used it, used it, and then one time she came to one of my retreats and she was freaking out. And I said, what? Why are you so panicked? And she said, the pendulum is not moving anymore. It's just, <laughs> it's staying straight. Her tried and true way <laughs> of receiving guidance through the pendulum, she said, what is the meaning of this? The thing is not, it's just not moving at all. And I said, yeah, you're, you're about to enter into another way. And, and that's the way it works, even with relationships. When, when we need someone in our life, when we can really teach and learn and grow from it, they're there. And when they disappear, it's because we don't need them anymore. It's always working together for the good. Um, you know, like they say, when, when, when God closes a door, He opens a window. You know, there's, there's always more opportunities, there's always new things coming in, and there's, it takes a lot of trust underneath there to, to, like you said, big question mark, and okay, here I am, I'm watching, I'm following the lights, and that's the way it is for now, and it's beautiful. So you can think, well, this, this has served me well, and it will just continue to serve me as long as it serves, and then if there's new things that come in, um, then, you know, you can be open. I know so many people are open to readings and tarot, and they just tell me, as I travel around, all the different ways that the Spirit reaches them, and it's like a symphony of support, mm -hmm. what I keep hearing. Yes? I have, I have a question. Um, so, I studied the Course for three years. Um, I, I, I did, I took courses, in it, and then I meditated the Course for two years in a row. And then, now, so I'm ultimately trying to get to that um, higher self, that's sort of the goal. And um, so I'm now taking another course, I've been sort of called to take a course, like it's sort of a Jungian psychology course, and it's kind of talking about how you go from your persona, which is just like your mask, through the ego, and which is the course is really great for the course in the room is great for that, and then you go through the ego, and then you go through through your shadow. And so, I'm wondering if you could talk about, um, so in, in order to get to your higher self, you kind of have to, I guess, embrace your shadow, or reveal your shadow, or something. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, a lot of it, it has to do with um, your unconscious will, your unconscious will drive you, and, and lead you, until you be, until you reveal it and become conscious conscious of it, yes. And then once you get to the higher self, you're part of the collective unconscious or something, or the collective consciousness, or I don't know yeah. what I'm saying. But can you talk a little bit about the shadow? Because that's kind of where I'm at right now, trying to. I don't know 
know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, the context of that. That's interesting. That's yeah. been part of the clips. Maybe we'll start with one with meeting his uncle Carl. Okay. Because at this point, he's still, he's still wanting, like, like you were just asking about the shadow. He's still not understanding about all these images and these memories. Um, they seem to be real external kind of events and memories, and and he's just beginning to start to see that 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 they aren't what he thought they were. That it's part that this was part of a setup, part of an unconscious setup to keep the mind Delusion. trapped. Delusion, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, interesting. Because I'm also writing down my dreams every night. So mm -hmm. like when you write down your dreams, you can, you actually can remember more of your dreams, and then you have more insight into what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Maybe we'll just try that clip okay, with Uncle that. Carl. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just. It's just one clue, one thing in the world, you know, like you, some of you saw the Truman Show, where, you know, you know, his, his dad from a previous episode appears on the set, and the, the voice tries to explain it away, or when the Cirrus light comes down and lands in the street, this theater light comes and lands in the street, and then on the radio it says, a plane begins shedding parts, you know, it, the ego is always trying to keep you in the human perspective. It doesn't want you to see from a transcendent perspective, because if you start to transcend fear, you're going to escape the ego, you'll escape the guilt, you go back into the state of heaven. And the ego doesn't want you to escape from the guilt. So and that's what a lot of times when we start to take steps on the spiritual journey, and we seem to have the naysayers that come to us and go, what are you doing? This spiritual journey is not practical. How is that going to help you in the future? You know, it, it's so bent on the future that it doesn't even see that the future is a construct. <laughs> the future, you know, the past is gone, the future is but imagined. Jesus says these concerned concerns are but defenses against present change of focus. That, that the future is a construct. You know, we're used to thinking when we studied psychology about defense mechanisms, denial, repression. Nobody told us in psychology class that the future was a defense <laughs> against the present moment, that the future was a defense against our reality. That's getting into a whole new level of defenses, and that's what he was just discovering, was there was a scar on one of these photographs and memories, and it wasn't on his arm. And that's when he went, these are all lies too. All of the the light memories and all of the dark memories are part of a system of, of keeping the mind asleep. Because who says we can judge happy memories from sad memories? You know, we know how it feels, but is there any reality to fear? Maybe when we were afraid, it wasn't that the circumstances weren't frightening us and the people weren't frightening us. Maybe it's just we had fear within our heart and we were perceiving a fearful world. Maybe we have a fearful interpretation that we need to heal. Mm -hmm. We don't have to redo the scene, we don't have to redo anything, we just have to start to realize, as long as I have fear in my heart, then that's tainting my perception. It's darkening mm -hmm. my perception. There's a, a man who, part of the Northwest Foundation for A Course in Miracles, mm -hmm. Paul Tuttle. I don't know if you've ever, any of you have heard of Paul Tuttle and the Raj material. Mm -hmm. But um, I studied that years ago and there was one great scene where, I think Paul was over in Hawaii, I believe, and, and he strained his back. He seemed to be carrying some heavy bags of groceries into the house. And he strained his back and then he turned to Raj or Jesus and says, can you help me out with this? You know, I've, I've got this strain in my lower back and everything. And, and Raj said, well, you think that you have this strain and this tightness in your back because you carried in the heavy groceries. <laughs> uh, but it's not that at all. And, and then Raj says, actually, you had a breech birth in this lifetime. And because of this breech birth, um, you still are holding grievances against the the people, the nurse and the mm -hmm. practitioners 
during this breach birth, and that's where that pain is coming from. So it totally oriented from some kind of an event that he thought was associating it with carrying the heavy groceries back to a grievance still in the mind around this breech birth when he was just an infant. And then Raj says, I will tell you something, it never happened. The birth never happened. <laughs> now now we're really, he's rolling it back, you know, into true forgiveness. You know, the birth never happened. This whole, all these projected memories of time and space are part of a setup to keep the mind guilty. Projection of bodies, projection of who did what to who, projection of victimization, all of that is part of this big trap, this big linear net of time and space to keep the mind guilty, so it won't wake up to its eternal reality. So, what does that show us? It just shows us that we have the power of interpretation, that we can learn to join with the Holy Spirit, join with our intuition, and see all of the memories from a new perspective, from a higher perspective. I traveled with a woman back in the like, early 1990s, 1991, 1992, and we were traveling, going, doing miracle gatherings down in Florida, and one time we were driving along in the car, and we picked up some flyers, and I was looking through the flyers in the car, and I said, oh look, there's an advertisement for a little miracle center, and they have a Course in Miracles hypnotist that works <laughs> at the thing. I love it. I mean, I see this, uh, Course in Miracles numerologist. Well, that's going to be interesting. What about that? Is? Course in Miracles hypnotist. So, I pass the flyer over to her, and she says, hmm, I think I'm supposed to have an appointment with this Course in Miracles hypnotist. So I said, okay, I'll drop you off and then come back later and pick you up. I dropped her off. He took her into hypnotic regression deep into her mind where she had these memories come back of her being sexually abused by her biological father. She said she had repressed all of these memories and this Course in Miracles hypnotist had, had brought them up. But the strangest thing is when I saw her, she said, yeah, I've been traveling with you, David, and I've been such in such a miracle-minded state of mind that when the memories came up, I was in this high state of mind. I could watch the memories with no pain. I could just see the scenes uh, from this high perspective. Without she was she was healed. It was almost like this seeing this hypnotherapist and traveling and doing all these gatherings with me were just showing her, oh, there is a higher perspective where there's no interpretation of abuse of a perpetrator and a and a victim child from this higher perspective which just gave her this sense of like, whoa, I just, I can see now that's the value of the miracle. It just sees the false as false. It doesn't see it from a, from a distorted victimization perspective. So then we were traveling around and she'd been in the convent, she'd, from a Catholic family, she'd gone in the convent when she was 14 years old, from like 14 to 22, 22, 23 years old in the convent to to become the Bride of Christ, you know, that nuns take the vows and so forth. And so she had all this kind of repressed stuff around the body and sexuality. So we traveled around a little more and we heard from a friend, oh, there's a, there's a Course in Miracles group that you should go to. And she said, well, you know, what, what is it? She, they said, yeah, it's a Course in Miracles group at a nudist colony. You see how the Holy Spirit knows how to crack a tough nut. If you've been in the convent from 14 to 22, and you've got a lot of repressed things around sexuality, there's nothing like the old Course in Miracles group at the nudist colony. You know? So I'm not, I didn't have any kind of charge on that, or I'm not like a voyeur or anything. I said, I'll drop you off. <laughs> it was the same thing with the hypnotist. I'll drop you off and come back later to get you. And so, uh, so anyway, I did. I dropped her off and I came back and she told me all about the experiences. And uh, it was very helpful for her. She said, well the course group, the, the people in the nudist colony wore clothes during the course group because I didn't want it to be too distractive uh, from reading the book. <laughs> so, you know, it's this and this and this. Later on, we traveled out west to Sedona, 
we were down, the Luckets were doing a big Course in Miracles uh, garden party there and so on and so forth. And at the end, um, Yulelia Luckett and, and Jack, they led everybody down to the creek beds, these red creek beds in Sedona, to, to take people into the water to do baptisms of a lot of these Course in Miracles students. And uh, again, I, I felt, I just was there with the swirl of the whole thing. I said, oh, she, I said, I think you should go. She said, yeah, yeah. So then she did that, and then she joined another woman, and they said, let's go skinny dipping. So you could see a lot of the things around nudity, sexuality, for somebody who's been in a convent, the Spirit uses what it, whatever it takes. There's nothing good or bad per se in form. It's like what will unwind the mind, what will loosen the repression, what will loosen the denial, loosen the guilt. It's not about morality of the do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs. It's about willingness to, to see the whole world from a new perspective, from a high healed perspective, which is what mind training is for. That's why we, we practice the Course. So that shadow question, that the shadow is, is the unconscious mind where, you know, when, when decisions are made and, and accepted as true, then they're pushed down into the unconscious mind, they become beliefs, yes. fixed beliefs. Yes. And until those get exposed, then it's more like the, the personality self is more like a robot acting out the shadow. Mm. And that's what dreams, Freud did have that right, when Freud said dreams are wish fulfillment. So if you still have a lot of unconscious guilt and pain and shame and fear, then the character that you think is you, on the surface of consciousness, is just acting out those unconscious beliefs. And therefore it becomes really important to get down there and get in touch with what's going on underneath. I've, did, I've drawn on some of the books, like one of the books I have in there, Awakening Through A Course in Miracles, I think there may be also in Movie Watcher's Guide, I have the diagram of the mind, mm -hmm. where I kind of draw these concentric circles, and Jesus gave me, this is kind of what your mind looks like, and you, underneath the perceptions are the emotions, underneath the emotions are the thoughts, underneath the thoughts are the beliefs, mm -hmm. and at the core is your desire, your point of power, your prayer where you can literally, through the power of prayer, transform your entire consciousness mm -hmm. just through the power of prayer, your desire for God, your desire for wholeness, for God, the Spirit, oneness, completion. So it, it helps too to kind of have a, have a bit of a diagram, so you can help me, I was always very, very graphic. Christian? Have you ever had a gathering, like, prayed with everyone? Yeah, we have, we have had prayers, yes, mm -hmm. meditations, just to call upon the Holy Spirit. You want to do that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, <I> <laughs> we could. Mm -hmm. Call upon the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds, illuminate our hearts. We offer the hidden parts of our mind back to you, Holy Spirit, to shine them away. We would no longer protect these beliefs and these thoughts from your healing light. Give us the strength to speak these thoughts, to expose everything that we have kept pushed down and hidden. Let us do this with a sense of confidence and trust that you will guide us every step of the way. We cannot fail in this healing. God's plan for our healing cannot fail. We must succeed in this healing, because it is God's will that we experience this everlasting happiness. 
eternal joy, unending peace. Symbolically, we hold hands, remembering that we do not walk alone. We walk side by side with our brothers and sisters. Use our sisters and brothers as reflections that we may see we are never alone. We have all the help in the universe with us. And anyone else who feels to share what the Spirit is telling you now to add to this prayer. May we release all of our fears and all of our darkness and may we see the light and may we remember that we are all one with God. We're so just here for support. I was saying in a couple places I've been here in California on this spontaneous trip that you know it's that through our prayers and through supporting each other that we're just in a this is a lifelong relationship of walking back to God and that all of us are a part of that and whatever one needs the other shows up to help. So many ways to stay connected nowadays, so many ways to communicate, just to be open to the answer or support coming, that you don't have to feel alone in this, or don't have to feel like it's a solitary journey. It seemed to be, in, in my life for, for years, that it felt very solitary, like I was, not in the sense with, with Jesus, it felt very strong, like he was guiding me, but but I find more and more now I just appreciate all the support that comes in so many ways and through people and friendships and relationships that are just there to help us and we can be trusting in that and let that come more and more into our, our awareness. So that's the way my life went from the solitary journey to more just with beloveds beloved people, beloved angels all around, all of us reminding each other. And it's been beautiful through the travels or communities or all kinds of ways. Skype calls, Facebook calls, you know, just there's just all kinds of symbols of of it being there. And then nowadays people are like him can I get your phone number? And I said, yeah. I just hand my, my phone over, <laughs> put it in, <laughs> just type, it, type your number in in my address book. And, and then, yeah, then we do talk. We call each other and, yeah, just support. So we've got a little time. Is there in, any other areas or questions or curiosities or anything that you'd like to raise up? Think about like uh, holy relationships. We talk about that and um, like special relationships too. Mm -hmm. Like your shadows. Yeah, the special relationships are all a reflection of of lack and need. 
so they're, they're filled with so many expectations and sometimes demands, and that doesn't feel natural. Demands and threats don't feel natural. We've all gone through those kind of experiences and thought, you know, that there has to be a better way than that. And as we practice this inner work and we, we learn to connect and we get into our, our function and our shared purpose, then we feel filled up from within. You know, our, we feel like our cup runneth over. We have so much to give and so much to share. And then we start to see that that's what relationships are for, is for that giving and that sharing and that extending. And, and uh, I found travel was a good mechanism for that, to, to learn to trust the Spirit on, as I would travel and meet people, just to trust that everything was being perfectly taken care of. And the dividing lines between where I began and someone else began, started to fade more and more, and holy relationship is ultimately really becoming connected to Source and seeing that connection reflected in everything and everyone. Very different from the programming about how we thought about relationships. I was kind of raised with the Protestant work ethic and you know, everybody has their own separate spaces and their own separate lives and goes their own separate ways. And then this miraculous experience is melting that away. It's turning to a melting pot of the mind where you start to feel relaxed and comfortable with wherever you are, whoever you're with. You start feeling it more from a, a holistic uh, quantum perspective that everything, everything and everyone is playing their part perfect and start to feel this thing of like, wow, it's all for me, not, not a personal me, but it's all for my, my mind awakening. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, what the holiness is, it's our very being. Hmm. There's probably not any kind of rhyme or reason or pattern to it anymore. It, it does say that in the Course too, that, that how does the advanced teacher of God spend his day? It says to the advanced teacher of God, this, this question is superfluous. It's, it's more like there's a, a rhythm and a flow, and it's, instead of it being like under personal control, it's that there's a feeling that everything is involuntary. Everything that's happening is just part of a, like an involuntary flow. You're like just beholding. I like that word beholding because when we just met with Judy Sketch and we had that wonderful uh, four and a half hour lunch that all Nikita could hear was to just behold, to just behold. It was a wonderful feeling. Every time I've had lunch, I've had like lunch with them about four times and and every time it's just this just it's just this beautiful flow and yeah you weren't if you weren't saying much you were just like there just beholding the whole thing you looked like you had a like a big smile on your face and you were very grateful it's fun. to be mm -hmm. part of the experience but it was almost like nothing to add to it it was all there and to know what a, what an important function that you have, you know, to behold the world in this new way. But with such a high function, then it's more trusting that everything will just orchestrate to support that presence. I had, you talked about having a, like a seven month old child. And um, I was on Facebook one time and this, a woman wrote to me and she was, saying, um, I think she had like, 
three young children and um, her husband was in an automobile accident and was completely um, paralyzed and completely dysfunctional. She lost her, her spouse. He didn't die, but he just became completely dysfunctional. So in far as terms of being an active partner and them sharing, working, raising these three young children, you know, it, everything shifted. So she went through depression and different things and she wrote to me and, and um, she just asked for help and we joined and the call started off with her crying a lot and sharing a lot of um, these emotions that were still in there and just the, the heaviness and the grief and the shock still of the whole thing. But as the call went on, we had never spoken. We were speaking on Facebook uh, Messenger and then it got lighter and lighter and lighter where she started to say, I just watch your videos all the time and I'm listening and um, and the little children's, you know, were of course listening along because she was there with her little children and they would say, are you still playing Hofmeister? Is, is Hofmeister still on there? Uh, aren't, they say things, aren't you getting a little obsessed with this Hofmeister thing? You know, and they, but they were listening along very well to all of it. Uh, and then when she would make a move or say something, they would say, I don't think that's what David would do. Or, you know, they started like channeling David. They would protest, but then they would become little channels. And the more she talked to me, we talked for quite a while, it went from grief and shock and to, I've got the most wonderful life with yeah. these children because I'm making them a part of my life and my mind training and my waking up and they are stepping right in and they're not wow. acting like children, they're very angelic, you know. Wow. And, and so the whole conversation after she started off went, got happier and happier and happier. And then she was, I asked her more about her life and everything and she's, you know, we talked about all kinds of things, relationships and she wanted to maybe date and, but she said if my husband had actually died, I could be over with that and move on to dating, but he's still, you know, he's, he's living with his family now and they have to do 24 hour around the clock care and so he's not in the house, but she couldn't date because he was still alive. She, if he died, she said, I'd, so we went through that whole thing mm -hmm. and then in subsequent conversations, um, she would say things like, uh, I would say, well, what kind of skills do you have? The Spirit can use your skills in this mighty function that you'll have in, in awakening. And she said, well, I originally from Turkey, but I, I lived in Germany, so I speak fluent German. I said, oh, I said, so maybe you could be over there if I go to Germany and do a, a conference or gathering, you could be the, the translator. Well, that would be nice. You know, go over there and trans oh that would feel really good, I would feel purposeful. And then um, she got to the point where she started, she had this miss, she went in, her, her son wanted a, a dog, so she went into the, the kennel this place and she met this dog that seemed to have eyes that were like primate eyes, you know, that were looking at her and she, then she sprung into a mystical experience with this dog mm -hmm. and she was like, oh my god. I just was one with everything. I threw this dog. It's the last place I would have ever expected. You know, not meditating or in the lotus position, just boom, right there with the dog. <laughs> and she's telling me all that. And then, and then um, the children would go over because she thought, oh, I don't, you know, I want to know about being a teacher of God with three young children. How that's going to work out? It's not your typical thing. Well, she, her, uh, I think it was like a brother-in-law. Her her husband's brother and his wife and children, they loved having the kids over, loved having the kids over, and this and this. And this conversation has continued on where the, they, she called one time and she said, uh, they want to adopt my kids and take them and integrate my kids as part of their family. And at first her reaction was the mom reaction, like, yeah, my kids. 
But then she started to go, whoa, what, what's happening? Is this part of the plan? You see, even something like children, even young children can be can taken as part of configurations for them to feel loved and, and have playmates and so on and so forth. And some of you know the story even of Mary Baker Eddy, who was the founder of Christian Science, that she had had a, a child, a son, and then she got into writing this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, and she got so sick that the protective services took the child away from her. And she ended up pouring decades into this, it's like a precursor of A Course in Miracles. It's one of the most amazing books on the planet, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. There's no mind in matter, there's no life, truth, intelligence in, in matter. And so the child was literally taken out of her life, went with a foster home, and moved out to Oklahoma, and she didn't see her son until I think she was about close to around 80 years old, where he came back with a group of men and tried to file a lawsuit against her, saying she had lost her marbles and she was totally insane. It came back as a lesson of releasing everything and trusting. There are so many things. All I'm saying is the mind is very powerful and as you give your life over and just say, I want the holy instant. I'm going to desire the holy instant, like you prayed in the prayer. I call upon the holy instant. I give to you my life as I know it. I give to you everything, my circumstances as I know it. I. I know that I have a part to play in the plan of awakening, and you must instruct me in that part. I would but follow, you shall lead. Once you get into the rhythm of that, then that's when I'm, everything speeds up. You know, things start to, to morph and reconfigure. It's like shape-shifting going on all over the place. And Jesus does say that, he says in the Course, if you will perform miracles, if you will let me perform miracles through you, I will arrange time and space. That's something we didn't get when we were growing up at the dinner table. <laughs> that we could have a function of being a miracle worker, and that Jesus Christ would rearrange time and space for us. You know, that just shows how holographic it is, that also shows how how quantum it is. If there's partners that we're to meet along the way, if there's mighty companions that we're to meet along the way, if there's collaborations and configurations that serve the whole, they will be there for us, without our effort. They will just show up. We don't have to personally try to figure it out. Figure it all out. We don't have to personally try to, oh, I can't do it until I first figure it out. No, Jesus, <laughs> says, no, you actually won't ever be able to figure, <laughs> figure the world out. He tells us that. And we say, well, just let me understand first. As soon as I understand, then I'll do it. And he says, no, actually peace and understanding go together and cannot be found apart. So peace comes when we relinquish our control and our investments in this world. And we are sourced, we are flowed through by, by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's, it's, it turns into quite an amazing adventure, you know, where the fears give way. Yeah, yeah I was traveling one time and this mother called me and she, she said, uh, you're going to be coming close to where my town is, can I meet you off the highway? And she knew about where I was traveling. I said, yeah. She said, oh, there's a pizza hut, well, I'll just meet you there. And so she met me, and we met for the first time. I didn't know her at all. We just met and just sat down at the at the booth to sit there, and, and she kind of got the drink, and she just the pizza came, and she just kind of put her elbows on the table and leaned in close to look into my eyes, and she says, "What are you experiencing right now?" And I said, "I said, can you feel it? We're the whole universe. The whole universe is with us here." right now, and she's like, wow, and because and it's that sense that there's nothing else. We were talking about that in recent talks here about well, the quantum way of looking at things, instead of Newtonian linear way, but this quantum way where you 
you see that that everything is is connected, and it's like what these are not receivers. The eyes are not receivers; they're projectors, right. and the ears are not receivers; they're projectors. And but if you go into that state of mind, then you can see that that everything and everyone is part of you, and there's no boundaries, and it's so vast. And then you you don't feel located. Which is a great feeling, mm -hmm. to, especially with travel, that helps you get out of this sense of feeling mm -hmm. located. Because mm -hmm. it's all rolling up so fast, and you know, I love that, mm -hmm. just enjoying all the encounters. Mm -hmm. I think the toughest thing is just letting go of, the, of attachment, you know, letting go of attachment. It's hard. It's hard, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. It can seem that way, but then there will come a, a threshold or a turning point yes. where it suddenly, like in an instant, just starts to dawn that it's that it's easier to let go, and it's harder to hold, yes. hold on to. But but the mind has to just come to that little tweak where it's like, ah, you know, where it's just a con like a convincing or a, an awareness that, that dawns. I find myself in that cycle a lot. Attachment, attachment, attachment. Oh no, I need to let go. Attachment. And it's just very hard. Um, I have such a hard time with it. There is a prayer of the heart for for healing, for love, for joy, and then the spirit is is responding and using all these symbols in amazing ways. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm so grateful. So grateful for how it all works. And just to, to say to everybody, you know, life takes care, the Spirit has really got us, you know, so so even though things can seem to fall away, we were just over at Sundari's, I think Gia was, I was up till two o'clock in the morning after the gather, gathering ended, sitting there talking, and it's beautiful because a lot of things in her life, she just goes deeper and deeper, things are just shifting and fading away and falling away, but she's just speaking it all, and then Spirit's coming in with what's helpful, what's next, yeah. um, just in amazing yeah. ways. Even with her husband, she thought they might be going different directions, but she, she just verbalized it, like, if we keep going on the way we're going, it's like mm -hmm. we're being pulled into two paths, but, but we just need that talk. We need to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk about this, and then he said, yeah, I really hear it. And, you know, that's ultimately what we, it's such a walk of trust, but just to with our hopes, with our with our dreams, with our desires, and with our callings and our guidances to be able to verbalize that mm -hmm. without fear of loss, without fear of rejection, knowing that it's it's all working to, for the good and that we'll be lifted up in in just amazing ways if we just have the faith and keep trusting. Mm 